everybody. Ooh. Well, it is 7.30, it is the third week of the month. It is time for Animatic T.O. Uh, so of course, every time I like to start with a few thank yous. Um, well, of course, I want to thank our venue, the Rhino. They've been, uh, this is our second time here and uh, we're really enjoying the space. So uh, please, I, I, I think I've already seen the trend starting, but please support them, buy drinks, buy food. Um, but uh, I don't think I really have to tell you because I see a lot of beer. Uh, <laughs> Uh, of course, this this week I especially want to this month I especially want to thank guys with pencils. Um, Andrew, I just saw Andrew Murray arrive. Adam is not here at the moment, um, but uh, I want to thank them because they had me on this this week's podcast and had us talk about Adam Actio and, and a bit about what we're trying to do here and what we're hoping to do in the future. So uh, give it a listen and and tune into them regularly. Um, I also want to thank uh, Canadian Animation Resources, always a big supporter of of this and. And it's a rare website that actually has a focus on what's happening in the Canadian uh, animation industry. Uh, Mike Valaket is the guy in charge of that, and he just had a baby, so he's not here to hear you, but applaud him anyway. <laughs> actually, his girlfriend had a baby, but anyway. Um, uh, also want to point out that in this very space, uh, twice a month, is Tunes on Tap. Uh, costume life drawing. So, you know, if, if you have uh, been trying to get back into your life drawing chops, there's an entertaining way to do it in a bar, even better. Uh, so, uh, check out their, uh, they're on Facebook as well, so check them out. Um, always, as always, I want to thank the support of TAS and of Taffy. Um, and as always, we have raffle items, so please, I hope you're holding on to your tickets. Uh, this month, very exciting, our, our guest, Chris Pern, brought three art of books. Um, one is the art of open season, <laughs> one is the art of, of Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs, and one is the art of Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs too. And if you're very, very nice to him, maybe buy him a beer, he will sign them. Uh, they're being raffled off individually, not one person's getting all three books. Uh, so there you go. So, uh, of course, this is uh, Adamatic Tiro, this is our logo. Um, but something was interesting happened last night. Uh, I decided with the wife to watch Arthur Christmas. Which is a great film. If you haven't seen it, you really should see it. And as we were watching it, uh, my, my eagle-eyed wife, who has a talent to do something which I can't do, which is read, <laughs> spotted something that, that was un unexpected. Uh, the Canadian Minister <laughs> of Defense is Chris Pern. And that's because I, I hadn't realized Chris had worked on this film as well. And I did the voice. And, and, and he did voice. <laughs> did you do the voice of the minister? Yeah, yeah. Okay, because you're an, an elf as well. The Canadian accent has kept me back. There, the there you go. However, <laughs> <laughs> um, they made a cross eyed not wall eyed. So. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, so before we get started, I want everyone to pull out their smartphones. Yeah. If you don't have a smartphone, that's fine. And then I want you to go to. Facebook, Animatic And if you haven't already liked it, like it. If you have, forward it to someone else. We're not trying to get up to 500 likes. And we're at 220, so it's a little bit of a distance. But we could make a Christmas miracle. So do that. Do it right now. And then when you're done, turn off your things that go beep. It's, you know, it's not like a movie theater. You can take notes on your, your uh, smartphones if you want. But please try and make sure they don't ring during the show. Um, Another thing I want to bring up is uh, we have Josh Bowen here. Is Josh, Josh, come up to the front so I can just point, point at him. Uh, if you're at all interested, uh, he's working with Mondo, and they are taking submissions for adult-themed pitches. So find this guy afterwards and ask him about it. Uh, those pitches are due by January 15th. So if you have ideas, uh, you know, dirty, nasty, terrible adult ideas, give it to him. Uh, and before we get into this month's talk, I want to tell you about next month's talk, uh, Stop Motion Animator with Stop Motion is Go. And so he's going to tell you about a little bit about his history in stop motion and about techniques and his, his view on the process. A um, lot of opportunity to, to learn. Um, but I, I know what you're all excited for is tonight, Chris Byrne, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. We're just going to flip over the laptop and he's going to come up here and get the show started. Thanks, 
Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for coming out. Um, so I want to talk about Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs because uh, the first film is really the the way we got to the second film. So uh, there's a story that um, took me four and a half years to live through in making this film. Uh, and I was, uh, I was ahead of story on this project. So, so I came in fairly close to the beginning and I got to leave before it got fun at the end. Um, but during that time, I had one of the most uh, interesting, kind of exciting experiences of my life, making this film with Chris Miller and Phil Lord. But before it was a film, uh, it was really a Darwinian process of evolution. You know, the, 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 the story came from this, which is a kid's book that people loved. Um, and we had to get in there and ruin it and turn it into a movie. <laughs> um, when it got bought by these guys. This is the evil empire of Sony Pictures Animation. Um, and uh, Chris and Phil, Chris Miller and Phil, Phil Lord, came into the studio. This, this is mythology that I think is true, but it's okay, we're not recording this, right? Um, uh, they came in the studio to pitch on a movie called Hotel Transylvania, which was one of the first movies that was being developed at Sony like 10 years ago. And they were sitting in the room getting the kind of feedback on, uh, on uh, Hotel T, and they couldn't stop looking at the fact that they had Claudio Chance meatballs on the wall. And they grew up loving that book. And so they went home, and after two weeks they came back, instead of pitching on uh, Hotel T, they pitched on Cloudy, and they pitched it as a disaster movie. What if we took this idea of food falling from the sky and turned it into like an Irwin Allen style, uh, you know, Roland Emmerich, sis bang boom, blow up, uh, all that kind of stuff. And the studio got really excited. So uh, in the beginning, they came up with this character named Flint. Flint's name actually came from Roger and me. Anybody seen that movie? <laughs> you know, so Flint Lockwood uh, is, is, is a derivation of Flint, Michigan, which is the shittiest place in the world. Uh, and so the idea is, uh, is that, but, but the idea was that this guy was actually the smartest man in the world. And he was going to end up becoming a pariah. So uh, this Flint Lockwood was uh, working at NASA, and he created this machine that could turn water into food, and, and it started to cause all these problems around the world. And uh, the way we were going to introduce this character was kind of like a, a Fox Mulder X-Files thing. So this is early beatboards to represent sort of where the movie was. Uh, yeah, we're going to see Blake's and, and, and so th this is just kind of give you an idea where we started. So this is uh, probably right around, what, 2006, 2007? So uh, imagine you're a starry sky in the Sonoran Desert and you see like a saguaro cactus up there. All of a sudden light falls upon it and you see that there's like these pink donuts stuck to it. And we cut wide and we see the entire Sonoran Desert floor is covered in these pink donuts. We cut close, see all these pink donuts. We, uh, a gloved hand comes in and picks one up and these two shadowy figures standing in these headlights are looking at these donuts, all of a sudden, waka, 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 waka. we see these black op helicopters coming over the ridge. They run into their car, they zip off, the helicopters are in pursuit. Suddenly the car disappears as the helicopters go over top. We pull down and we see that this car is actually in the shape of a taco and it's in this de it's kind of like <laughs> desert gulch. And inside we see these two hairy men kind of looking up over the window. And uh, as the scene kind of progresses, we meet this guy named Flint Lockwood, who's apparently the smartest man in the universe, and his partner, who looks a little bit like a chimpanzee. And, uh, and suddenly this weather equipment comes over the top and they kind of drive off. And as they drive off, we have the title Sony Pictures Animation. We push up to the sky, we see Cloud of Chance of Meatballs, and the stars turn into these little bubbly things, and an egg drops in, the kind of, uh, you know, the, the parody of food falling from the sky kind of thing. And we pull out and we see that, that Sam Sparks is this plucky reporter who lives in this shitty town in the middle of, of nowhere in the East Coast. And uh, she's a reporter, and she's loading up her van, and she goes next door, we meet uh, Brent McHale, who's like the, the coolest guy in town, and he's really upset because Sam is just taking a job in New York and she's leaving the island. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, basically we see all of these characters start to come together and they're gonna collide. So we have the exact same characters, but a completely different fucking movie. Um, <laughs> why animate this? That was our big question, because we have a bunch of human characters in a human world, and the problem with Flint being the smartest man in the universe is that he's not very relatable. At least I don't relate to him, because I'm kind of the opposite of that. Um, and we were lacking a really deep rooting interest for, you know, why should we give a crap about this guy? So we started over. This is gonna be a repeat panel. We're gonna see this a few times. So we rebroke the story. So we decided, okay, what if we told our story? We're like seven artists sitting in a room. What if we made it an artist's journey? Flint is a big character from a small place. Uh, he's like a backyard inventor. Um, and in this version of the story, um, Flint's aspiration was to get to this 
place called the United Nations or the United Science League in Iceland. And the conceit here was that we were going to start the movie by introducing a hero. And the hero wasn't going to be the main character. We were going to, we were going to flip it. So uh, what I'm going to show you is going to be a little disorientating. And the reason I'm going to show it to you is because I always love this sequence. Now, I didn't board this. These are, these are boarded by a guy named Andy Gaskell. Um, anyways, I'm just going to pitch it, and you guys can watch it. So is that cool? <laughs> so open on an Arctic tundra. And we see a camera kind of whipping over top of a Roland Emmerich style. We push through a, uh, a hot spring, and we see this, this beaming tower on the horizon. We push in on it. As we get closer, we see the symbol of the UN, and jets whip by. And we come around, and we see these amazing scientists talking to hot girls. And as we push past towards the jet, we smash cut to a Hummer going by, and we see a, a missile being loaded into the bottom, and we see two pairs of sexy legs walking on wet cement towards camera. And we meet Jenkins, and he says, baby, they have detected nano radiation signature in US waters. It's probably nothing, but the UN didn't get to be the most powerful organization on Earth by being sloppy. And he starts to climb up there. And she goes, Jenkins, wait. He turns. Would it kill you to eat something? And she holds his sandwich up to him, and he lowers his glasses. No, I guess it wouldn't kill me. Cloudy with a chance of meatballs. <laughs> and from that title, we, we transition to this mad scientist lab, and we see this shadowy character <sighs> commencing micro titration. He hits a button, <laughs> stuff bubbling everywhere. Initiate genetic fusion. We see another hand kind of throw a switch. <laughs> and off of that, we. <laughs> see a mad scientist lightning bolt hit the lab. We cut wide and we see this cloud formation over top of this island and the jet comes in. Here comes Jenkins. Nano radio meter is going to the danger zone. Sorry, Haystack. Looks like I just found your needle. You see the jet kind of come into the thing there. He's closing in, but he takes a second to take a bite of that sandwich. Mmm, that's a good sandwich. We see him flip the switch. At that point, all of a sudden, kaboom! This big yellow explosion comes out of the top of the lab, hits him in the face. Ah! And he goes backwards, mayday, mayday, you and Jet Bop, Piper, Fox, Sprat, X-Ray, Charlie, Charlie, struck by a very hot substance, appears to be chicken pot pie. And he's like falling backwards. Ah! And as he goes back, ah! Mm. Oh, it's good. Ah! He hits the water. <laughs> Into the water. The sandwich floats up. He smiles. He wipes some, some pot pie off his face. He's about to take a bite. All of a sudden, kaboom! We see the jet go up. And we pull out from the jet and we pull inside to this lab. And we reveal that the guy who uh, was a mad scientist is actually just a dude wearing a bucket. And he pulls off his hat and we meet Flint Lockwood. So, in that version of the story, uh, Flint. <laughs> Um, Flint Lockwood uh, didn't realize he just, you know, almost killed Jenkins. And Jenkins, in that version of the story, kept coming back into the movie, trying to get into the movie. And, like, everything Flint invented kept kind of fucking with him. So, uh, like, the out-of-sider, you know, who'd get back on the island, you know, I made it, and the out-of-sider stuff would kind of hit him and knock him back in the water. And, um, but the problem was we were still lacking that rooting interest. Why do we really care about Flint? So we had to invent some reason for Flint to kind of be relatable. And so the idea that Flint wanted something was really important to us. So we had this idea that he had this wall of achievement. And part of the, 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 the draw for Flint was that he wanted to get off the island. He wanted to go work at this place called the Science League for this guy named Vance LaFleur. Now remember that name because he's going to come back in Cloudy too. Um, so the idea, the motivation for Flint was to leave his town. And his desire to leave uh, was helping us in Act One. The problem, uh, so the conflict, his want versus a need, didn't add up to our ultimate plot. Because we knew we needed the, the movie to fight for the island. We wanted to stay there. We wanted the, 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 the third act to, to, to sort of need to save this place. So Flint was supposed to save the world and reject this false heroes. But why? Was there a simpler want? So we threw all that out and we started over again. This is what we knew. We knew the food was going to fall from the sky. We knew that Flint was the guy who made it happen, and we knew that it all took place on an island. So what if the food was the problem? Flint tries to fix it by inventing this, the Flintus metaphor, the Flint Lockwood diatonic super mutating di dynamic food replicator. I can do that better. The Flint Lockwood diatonic super mutating dynamic food replicator, or the Flintus metaphor for short. <laughs> and so he's doing this for the town. 
The problem <laughs> is, is starvation funny? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, so we had to come up with another concept, another idea. So instead of the idea of like the town starving and needing food, they had plenty of food. It's just the food was shitty food. It was sardines. Uh, you know, poached, fried, boiled, dried, candied, and juiced. <laughs> so the, the sardines became a metaphor for the need for this community. Now, now that we tied the invention to this town's need, we needed an inciting incident. And of course, that was this scene was boarded by one of my favorite board artists, Jack Shu. And you can't clean up his drawings because they don't get any better than that. They're just, they're just brilliant. They're so funny. Um, and, and out of the box, which is amazing. But this is the scene where Flint is like trying to stop his machine from escaping. And he hits a mailbox, and he hits a fire hydrant, and he goes over a car, and of course it's a stop sign that stops him because we're dumb. And, uh, and, and you know, he loses the machine. Now that, so we had all that kind of stuff working. Uh, the problem was, in this version of the movie, we're still struggling to find out what he wanted as a character. Now it seemed like the low-hanging fruit was he was doing this all for the girl. I mean, I've done a lot for girls in my time, so it made sense. Uh, so we had Sam Sparks be from the island, and she was like this cute little thing that he was pining for his whole life. So he invented spray on shoes for her. Uh, they were at the zoo, and, and you know she was like, I wish I knew what those monkeys were thinking. So he steals one and turns it into uh, Steve. Um, and of course, it all goes wrong and eats her hair. And it's it's like you, you fast forward now. He's like in his twenties, and you know Brent, who is still the coolest kid in school, is still the coolest kid in, in in life. And you know Sam is still way out of his league. And the problem was Flint looked weak. I mean, this movie had something that we could understand, but it wasn't compelling, and it wasn't making people happy when they're watching the movie. It's like fuck that guy. I wish he'd just get over her. Um, and Sam seemed like a pain in the ass, shallow person. Like, why wouldn't you love this guy? He's doing all this stuff for you. So none, neither of those emotions were what we wanted the audience to feel. So we needed to kind of find also a relatable kid want. Um, so the Sam story was a perfect B story. What we needed was an A story. So we started over. Uh, enter Tim. So Tim originally was a guy who was working at the tackle shop, and he was modeled to only be waist up. He sat behind a counter, counter, didn't have any legs, was not related to Flint in any way, shape, or form. So Chris and Phil originally kind of resisted the idea of having a father, father story because, um, you know, it's been done in every movie from The Lion King on through, and the idea of kind of having this dead father or a father didn't love you, it was just, we've all seen it before. But we got kind of excited about the idea of a relationship, a relationship stuck in miscommunication. And the fact that Tim didn't understand his son but wanted the best for him, that was something that we could start to grab onto. And the idea that Tim didn't talk, and originally Tim was just kind of this character who would grunt and not really communicate with his son, so that whole payoff at the end with the thought translator, if you remember that, that was all coming from a position where this guy didn't know how to communicate at all. Now, of course, when they cast James Caan, which was a studio thing, and you know everybody was excited about that, you had to give him words. So we ended up kind of finding that fishing metaphor idea. So in this version of the film, like you know, Steve was invented for Tim. Everything was for Tim. And 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 what we started to find was that Flint wanted to prove his self worth, self worth to his father. And by saving you know something important to Tim, he was saving important things for the world, as in the world. And that was good. So the idea that this father's validation led us to kind of a, a relatable conflict based out of love that tied to our plot. This was the movie. So we could care both on an emotional and a meta level. And we could relate to Flint when he does stuff like this. He's like, ah, I promise not, not to blah, 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 and then Tim's eyes go down. Because um, we've all done that. We've all cracked up the car. We've all sort of had moments where it's like our father is not necessarily proud of us. But it gave us an arc for him. And we were able to find a way to make it fresh and sort of feel original to this movie. So as Tim, arc, as Tim arcs into a, a story where he's working against his son to helping his son, you know, we were able to kind of ha find some great comedy moments with like, like, like the father-son connection with the, with the emailing and what have you. It also allowed us to play all of our other archetypes, positive archetypes such as Sam. You know, we had our meet cute where they collide and uh, their, their, their relationship starts in conflict. And when the characters begin to connect over the event of the food falling, um, there's a genuine sort of want for these two people to, to, to be together. So out of this conflict comes understanding. And out of that understanding comes a relationship, and out of that relationship comes love. And originally, when they were going to kiss, and it was animated this way, he kind of puffed out his cheeks in a little tiny bit of 
the tongue came out, and that was what Tam and Sam was kind of struggling with, and our sensors were like, you can't do that, so it turned into a blood kiss. <laughs> um, Earl became the, uh, the, the mirror to Flint Swan, and originally he was, he was always going to be the town cop, he was always going to be voiced by Mr. T, but the idea that, that this guy had the relationship with Cal that Flint wanted with Tim uh, suddenly put him into the movie in a more um, emotional way, which was awesome. Um, and this is a scene that we ended up cutting, but like we, we actually had a version where we saw Cal get sucked up into the spaghetti twister, and Earl tried to get him and failed, and there's that moment where the cop who can't lose uh, loses his son, and that sort of added up into this moment. We found that it was just playing too heavy, and there's a point in the movie where you want to laugh, and we see a man lose his son to a twister. It was hard to pull back from that, so um, so we lost that thing, but we still kept him throwing up on his dad's back. Uh, <laughs> um, Brent, of course, was uh, wanted the same thing Flint wanted. He wanted the town's validation. He just had it his whole life. He was afraid of losing it. So the two of them start to kind of play in a nice way. Brent represents the town's want to be relevant. So when Flint and, T and Brent start to bond, you start to see Flint's bonding with the town. All of this was working. Even Steve, he, his want was just to eat gummy bears. And by the end of it, he gets to do it after he pulls out the heart and you know, fights one on a plane and turns it into stardust. <laughs> Even our negative archetypes, like Mr. Mayor, uh, you know, the mayor lands on our theme. Bigger isn't always better. You know, these are uh, Chris Mitchell is one of our story artists, one of the funniest board artists I've ever seen in my life. And I know bigger is better. I know I do. Uh, and he's like throwing the, the monkey off his back, literally. Good boy. Uh, so by cracking the relationship to Tim, we actually cracked the movie. And there's that point that I always, I like to call it the click when you're working on a sequence or when you're working on a film, when suddenly the movie starts to work. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things that you hunt for. It could take you an hour, it could take you a week, it could take you three years. But once we cracked that relationship with Tim, there was that moment when everybody on the film felt this calmness come over us, and we just started to have fun again. And, uh, you know, then we could just play with the tone. So this, you know, in, in a movie where, you know, we have this disaster thing, we could have a shot that went on for like 12 minutes where Flint runs around, the twister, goes inside of it, runs into Joe Town, uh, right there, hits a stop sign again, goes through a basketball hoop, comes out, and ends up in his backyard. Um, so we can play the silliness of the film. And what I learned is that you shouldn't panic when things don't work. You should just trust the process. And it's hard to do when you got $100 million on the table and people yelling at you. But, you know, really, it's all about the conversation. And we should have fun and be stupid. And that was the end until I got the call to come back onto this thing. <laughs> you all with me still? So, um, I was living in England working on Arthur Christmas, and, uh, you know, part of, was that? Ah, sure, whatever. Yeah. Depends on what you want to see. <laughs> so, I was working in England working on uh, Arthur Christmas, and uh, uh, as you know, uh, the weather in England is quite shitty, so I was walking home from work one day, and I get this phone call from the studio, and it was Chris Miller, Phil Lord, and Cody, Cody Cameron, who's my co-director. And they were all in L.A., which was, you know, lovely, sunny, and warm. They were like, you know, come on back. We, you know, we, we, the studio wants to do a sequel. Uh, and Chris and Phil were already on, on the slate to do Lego and Jump Street, so they were busy. And uh, they were like, you know, why don't you come back and, and steer this boat, and we'll just whisper in your ear. And uh, I, I got into a bush because I couldn't hear anything. It was like windy. I was like, you want me to what? You're fucking crazy. No. And I, because I, 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 I didn't think you could do it. I didn't think there was enough stuff there. But... What happened was very quickly we started to talk and we started to have the conversation about what sorry about the what if for this film. Now, what most people don't know is that Cloudy One had a completely different ending. So we had uh, you know a whole monster movie ending where there was this giant food cracking in the water that Flint had to eat through its butt to get inside of it. Face to foot, this metaphor. While the whole town was fighting the zombie food stuff, and the movie was two and a half hours long. And when the executives saw it, they were like, "No." Um, <laughs> But we had this itch to do this monster movie idea. So we took the idea that made the least sense from Cloudy 1, which was the living food, and we decided to pick up that ball and run with it for Cloudy 2. So in case you forget, here's one of my favorite clips from Cloudy 1. Can you turn the light off? Dad! Guys? Go, 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 go
picture got a cue. I mean, this one just walked right up and it <laughs> So, so we immediately kind of jumped into character design, which is a weird place to start a story. Um, so my, my co-director, Cody, went home one weekend um, after stopping at Ralph's, which is a local grocery store, and he bought a bunch of produce. And <laughs> in his backyard, he started to make these little food animals, and he was like kind of uh, creating little villages and subcultures, and you know, there was sweet versus savory, and... Uh, uh, it expanded into all sorts of other fruits and vegetables, and we brought that into the studio, and they were like, yes! I mean, we, I spent four and a half years on Cloudy One, always feeling like we had a great movie that nobody believed in, and we just came in with, with, with these little food creatures with map packs, and they were like, yes! Let's make that movie! Um, so we very uh, early on hired an amazing man named Craig Kelman. I don't know if you're, I, are you guys familiar with his work? Uh, Madagascar, you know, kind of going back into everything in Hollywood, you know. Uh, he is like one of the best character designers ever, and um, uh, he went away for a weekend, and we kind of pitched him the concept of the movie that basically the food's evolved, and while Flint is gone, um, and the whole town's evacuated, this kind of land of the lost grows up. And so he went away for a weekend, and came up with like 200 different food animal ideas. And this is where the puns started. So if you hate puns, I'm sorry. Because um, they don't get any better from here. Um, so we started to hone in on, like, you know, there's like fettuccine Alfredo, owl Fredo, you know, Reese's monkeys, you know, melon colonies, which are made with cantaloupes. Um, and they were fine, and they were fine. And we, we started to sort of, you know, find that shape language that fit in with our, our human characters. Um, and, and this guy uh, popped up fairly early on. This is Barry, who was actually voiced by Cody. And if Cody was here, he'd go, Babadoo! And you'd all clap and applaud, and <laughs> you'd feel great. Um, but he's not here, so. <laughs> um, and, and what we, I, I could be wrong about this, but what I remember, I drink a lot. What I remember <laughs> is that we took Sam's eyes and we kind of stuck them on one of the strawberries from Cloudy One. And then, and then Todd Pilger and our design team uh, kind of tricked them out, made the, the seeds all kind of symmetrical, and we very quickly mocked up this little model. And uh, we, we, we did a little test, sort of putting this berry in the world with our characters from the first film. And we brought that to the studio, and what the experience was was blah, 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 story, 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 berry. And they saw this thing and went, yes. So this was the test that we, that we did for our, our people. How will we ever get out of this jam? <laughs> we used to have that explode to it. <laughs> it was pretty dumb. <laughs> But not all of our food was gonna be sweet. I mean, we couldn't just make a very soft movie in that tone, so we knew we needed to have uh, uh, like a T-Rex in the woods. So the idea of Flint's first, kind of, if you look at Flint as Adam, then, then, then sort of like the temptation that sort of brought him into the first movie was the cheeseburger. That was the first thing that came out of the phlogiston for it was a thing that he made for uh, the town. So the idea that the cheeseburger is the biggest, baddest monster in the woods was sort of exciting to us. And it was the first thing that we encounter in the movie. It's, the, it's sort of the, 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 the first animal that starts to turn the table in terms of our, our empathetic swing in the film. Um, and so early on, we did another test with the cheeseburger. Now, the context with this test is, uh, we were thinking that there was going to be this subculture in the food, that, that the cheeseburger was like hunting its condiments, and like there's tigers in the woods, that you would have some food that would never be redeemed, it would just be kind of like monster food. Um, and ultimately what we were trying to do was trying to figure out if we could take the buildings from Cloudy One, stick them in the jungle, and put this food in there with our characters and have it all feel like one idea. So it was all kind of fitting together. So this is a cheeseburger test. And also what we're playing with here is how the different animals move. So the cheeseburger can move different than the pickles, which are more like kind of the stooges. So um, I'll just let it play.
Tim, Tim's like one of the early ideas. Um, so um, you remember that guy, Vance LaFleur, that I talked about in Cloudy One that we, uh, we had to lose. So the idea that, that Flint had his kind of aspirational wall of, of, uh, of, of success that he was kind of aiming for in the first film, we hung on to that idea, but we had a sort of more historical characters like you know Thomas Edison and, and uh, Einstein and uh, Farland, all those kind of kind of great you know American inventors and European inventors from the history of science. The idea of Chester V though being the catalyst of this movie became very interesting because emotionally Flint at the end of the first film was like 14 years old. So he started the film maybe like eight years old. He had eight year old solutions to problems and by the end of the film he was like 14. So he kissed a girl, kind of started having relationships with, with like humans and, uh, and you know was, was starting to become like a person. Um, I have a 13 year old and she's starting to become a person too. It's a pain in the ass. Um, so the idea that you know he's gonna graduate and go to high school was really interesting to us. So the idea that Chester could come to this place, represent this sort of ideal of science and innovation and be like the best version of what Flint wanted to be contemporary was really interesting to us. And it gave us an emotional change that we needed to kind of drive Flint into a new movie. So we looked at a lot of the kind of blue jean billionaires of our time. So the Richard Bransons, uh, you know, there's certainly Steve Jobs, there's some Jeffrey Katzenberg, there's, you know, um, <laughs> Mark Cuban. Uh, we looked at uh, 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 Richard Attenborough from Jurassic Park as being one of the touchstones too. Uh, not that this design is for that, but the goatee actually came from there. We started to kind of refine this guy that here's this guy who's like super energetic. He's like kind of old, but he's like really energetic and really healthy. And, and the idea that his design sense um, represented uh, the light bulb, which is you know the cartoon universal symbol for an idea. So the idea that this, uh, this light bulb icon sort of represents Chester was, uh, was really exciting to us. So these are all Craig's designs that led us to this kind of appealing character. The other thing is that the, the, the idea that Chester was just like Flint. So he was a small time backyard inventor growing up in the middle of nowhere. And unlike Flint, he never had that moment where the community sort of embraced him and said, we understand you and we love you and we appreciate what you do. So he kind of built this empire built on spite, where it's all about, you know, I'm gonna be super slick and because I, I know I'm better than the rest of you and I'm gonna build this empire based on that need to prove it. And so that's why Chester is kind of this hyper slick, cool guy. And I'm gonna let uh, Pete Nash talk about the way he moves and how the animators and our animation team really helped us find this character on the story side. By the way, Pete Nash is Canadian. He's from Vancouver. <laughs> In Cloud with a Chance of Meatballs 2, the animation team had the challenge of defining one of the most conceptual characters in Sony Pictures Animation and Imageworks history with Flint's childhood idol, Chester V. Chester is the CEO of LiveCore, the most innovative cutting-edge technology company imaginable. He embodies his role so entirely that his body and head are literally the shape of his logo and motif for LiveCore a light bulb. Chester's well-devised public image is one of a touchy-feely New Age guru. He works hard to come across as a warm, approachable, yet enigmatic leader. Being brilliant, he knows that the easiest way to get people to follow him is to win over their hearts and minds, to manipulate them. But are you sure you want to take this on alone? Yes! Hey, do you say alone? Alone it is, then! To portray all this, we felt that he should have the ability to think on multiple levels. As the ultimate multitasker, every time he is speaking to someone, he is simultaneously devising a performance with the intended goal of maximum impact. Live up to your full potential, or walk away and let the food monsters destroy Lady Liberty. To exaggerate this, we gave him dancer-like control and the ability to impossibly isolate any part of his body in space at any time. We made his movements elegant and precise with a flourishy finish and rarely a sudden snappy motion. One movement would anticipate another as Chester would effortlessly lead your eye with fluid, rhythmic, mesmerizing motion. 
It's lonely at the top. So Chester devised holograms of himself that are programmed to hold a conversation. He often held meetings with his make-believe staff in his rustic, warm office, which stood apart in stark contrast to the clinical design of the LiveCore lobby. My holograms and I were having an urgent brainstorming session. To accent his scientific qualities, he made his posing very geometric and mathematical, always standing very upright with his limbs either at perfect 90 or 45 degree angles, as much as possible. We needed him to have a wide range of motion, so walking the line between this and his rigid posing was always a challenge. Occasionally, for extra punch, we would lock him to the camera space, giving the effect of Chester having total control over his world. Flint definitely has his hands full if he wants to impress his childhood hero, Chester V. Your lap vest looks even cooler in person! Thank you. The lack of sleeves frees up my arms to do this. Whoa. So beyond Chester, we also had a new character named Barb, and and the kind of uh, mythology of Barb is that, you know, Chester had a show when he was younger that Flint used to watch. That was kind of like a Carl Sagan Cosmos thing, and so Barb would show up at the end of every episode and she would talk, and that was one of the impetuses for Flint to create Steve. The idea that you know if you're a great inventor, you would have a talking primate of some sort. But Barb's technology is a lot better than Steve, so you know she's actually got a human brain inside of her ape brain like a turducken, which when I was in Argentina I had to explain what a turducken was, which makes people hate Americans more. <laughs> <laughs> um, early character design stuff, uh, you know, we had some really kind of fun, like stuff that just made us laugh. So, you know, she was kind of in the world of like Rhea Perlman, Gene Simmons, uh, you know, um, the, the idea that she was kind of, uh, kind of uh, overdone, I guess is the word, you know, kind of uh, frizzy, like she's from the 80s. Um, ultimately, that kind of honed down, and we began to find like a cuter, more uh, empathetic version of Barb. And I'm just going to show you a scene that I love that we had to cut from the film that really I think anticipates and sort of shows how she. It uh, fits into the movie as an antagonistic character for not only Flint, but also Sam. And that Sam, her whole life is always threatened by being smart. And here's this, you know, primate female who never has been shy about her intelligence. And so that kind of, that kind of conflict between this competitive female thing was really fun for us. Um, also, it's really awesome to see how she moves in this tube. So check her out. <laughs> Uh, it seems like only yesterday I was in this porta potty for the very first time. Yeah, it seems like only yesterday I cracked cold fusion. That's the kind of stuff I do. <laughs> Kristen Shaw's awesome. Um, so, you know, as we're going through the journey of breaking the story, coming up with the visual look and feeling of this film, um, you know, our development team was right there with us. And for me, as a story artist, this was a new experience because while we interact with our visual development artists, I had never worked with them this intimately. And sort of seeing the amount of thought and the amount of uh, uh, depth and construction that goes into the making of a movie from that perspective of watching it happen was really cool. So early on, we, you know, we, we begin to break down our color script because color is a very important emotional uh, uh, driver for your characters and for the story. So ultimately, uh, our, our, our lead um, uh, art director, uh, Dave Bleich, started to look at film and started to look at photos and started to pull uh, color palettes into the story as we were evolving that. And so you start to see how the two things are holding each other's hands in terms of how we want to feel about the movie. And from this, he was able to build a color script. Now you can see from these, these paintings that they're very loose. And, and they're not about detail. They're really about feeling and emotion. And, and to me, they sort of represent you know, just quick gestural ideas, which is the same thing as what we do with storyboards. Um, it's ideas that help sell the emotions and the emotional possibilities for a sequence. And from these, we start to develop into our location design. Now, Cloudy One was really heavily influenced by a fellow named Sasek. I don't know if you, you are you guys familiar with like the This Is London, This Is Edinburgh, This Is San Francisco books? They're fantastic. If you haven't seen them, look them up. It's, I think it's S-A-S-E-K. It might be, I think it's, it's European, so it might be even weirder than that. But um, uh, the, the books are fantastic. And that really drove Cloudy One. Now, Cloudy One, if you ever watch that film, is very horizontal, and our action is vertical. 
So the, the town is very low, very, um, you know, fitting into that widescreen format, so it was in contrast with the falling food. Our movie, uh, for Cloudy 2, was going to be about what's hiding in the shadows. Not about what's going to hit you in the head, but what's hiding in the shadows. So our action was horizontal. So we wanted our film to get higher. We wanted our film to feel bigger. We knew we were going to the jungle. And when we went to San Fran Jose, California, we wanted to push what was graphically interesting about San Francisco. So we took that Sasek style and we tried to, to make it feel bigger. And then when we started to meet Chester and we started going to go into his world, his shape language was different. It wasn't Sasek. It was more organic. It was more fluid. It represented him in the way that he moves. It was control. Now one of our problems was we had to build this city. Now anybody who works in CG here knows that you can't just draw it and then sew. You have to build it. And we had to make sure that the city looked good from many different angles. The problem was we were only in that city for about five minutes of the movie, so we couldn't spend a lot of money. So early days, uh, one of our designer, our, our, our three our CG designers, started working with Justin Thompson, our production designer, to come up with a system to kind of build three buildings that were like Lego pieces. And these Lego pieces would come together to make an entire city. And I'm going to let the visuals kind of sell it here. Concept's going to come back later because it became one of our themes for Cloudy in terms of how we got a lot for a little bit of money. Um, looking at our location design, we knew we wanted to have the island kind of represent a mood ring for Flint. So if you watch Cloudy 1 and you notice his lab will change color every time he goes back in there because the lab was really reflecting his emotional place. And we wanted the island to be like a creative experiment where Flint's head kind of cracked open and spilled over this entire place. And so as Flint goes on his journey, the island responds to where he is. So as he's going into hubris the, and, and becomes more isolated from his friends, the island is going to respond. So we knew we needed to build a system that allowed us to kind of get a, a road movie uh, quality to, uh, to a CG film that was cheap and inexpensive. So Justin Thompson, our production designer, came up with this idea of let's take a bunch of different shapes and, 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 uh, and leaves and, 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 and plant types and put them into one environment, but let's attach to them the ability to change their color at the source. So as opposed to modeling a, 
you know, a thousand different, you know, jungle shapes, we, we modeled a few hundred, and we gave all of them the ability to change their properties of texture and color. And with this, we were able to build a very dynamic space that could evolve as our characters evolve. Um, early on, this is, a, just, this is just what it looks like at the rudimentary step, where we're basically taking the, 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 the pieces, the assets from Cloudy 1, putting them into the world of Cloudy 2, and surrounding them by all this jungle stuff. And when it's all lit up, it looks a little bit more like this, which was really cool. And all of this is being controlled without using light. This was like on white light. So all of the, the color was coming from the property of the props. And this allowed us to kind of be really dynamic with our sets and get a lot of color um, you know, naturally to come from the props, not the light. And, and so we could go into different places and sort of reflect Flint. So in this situation, he's going home. So we wanted that kind of comforting home feeling. It's Christmas time, red and green. You know, of course, we're doing more like kind of Mexican, but it, it, it's, it's that kind of complimentary, um, comforting thing. He goes into his lab. His lab is blue, but he's got Chester's influence. We're starting to bring in the color orange. As he goes on the journey, I mean, we're wanting the audience to start to root for the food at a, at a certain point in the middle of Act Two. So the colors start to tell us subliminally, the food's good, what Flint's doing is wrong. And so we're hoping that the audience is starting to switch its allegiance between, um, you know, Flint's want to be like Chester and the, 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 the other characters who want to save the island. And then when Flint begins to, you know, get to the point where he's gonna break up with his friends, everything gets austere, everything gets sort of bland. And Tim has his own journey. So all of this was kind of feeding us on the story side. Um, in terms of the new stuff, uh, you know, Cloudy One, we had a rule that the food always had to look delicious. No matter what, that you wanted to buy this, somebody would pick a hamburger off the ground and eat it. So we wanted to kind of be able to keep that concept going in this film. But we were scaling stuff up. And believe it or not, one of the hardest scenes to do was, oh, sorry, I'm jumping around here. Let me start over again. This is about the characters. So, uh, you know, remember the thing about the, uh, the buildings? Uh, one of the hard things that we had in Cloudy One is if you watch it, there's like a, re a repeating Joe Town that shows up every four characters in the crowd. So we knew we went to, to uh, San Fran Jose. We want to have like a diverse audience and a diverse sort of representation of people. So we built this thing Craig Kelman came up with about eight male characters, eight female characters. And we were able to put them on different body shapes. So just like the buildings, what we were doing was using assets within our designs to create opportunities for diversity. Um, and we could do a lot, which is changing hairstyle and uh, skin tone. And in between these morphings, we found thousands of characters. So that's, that looks like Justin Thompson, our production designer. Hmm. And so when you watch the crowd scenes in Cloudy 2, if you ever you know, get the DVD and you're pausing them, I'm really proud of the fact that the crowds don't look repetitive and that you actually have this sense of a very diverse group of people that <laughs> live in a city like Toronto or like San Francisco. That's Chris Ricardi. Um, and on the effects side, um, this is about the scalable food. So one of the hardest things that we had to do All right, we're rolling. Barefoot, was deal with the syrup. So early on, Theo Vandernew uh, and his team of effects animators filled up a tub of maple syrup and experimented with the effects of like scaling up something that we're used to seeing on pancakes. And what would it be like to actually walk through it? He lives in California and his legs are that white. <laughs> but you start to see how the syrup is hanging off of the, the, the appendages. I think this was last where he put his foot in it. Funny story with this. So when they were done doing this test, they put the syrup in garbage bags, as you would do to get rid of syrup that you put your feet into. And they threw them out in the back of the, the studio in Culver City. And everybody went home. Middle of the night, you know, one of the security guards walking back there, and all this brown shit's leaking out from these bags by the, uh, by the, by the can. And Americans are afraid of terrorism. They're like, what the hell is that? And so, you know, they call the hazmat team. So the Culver City Fire Department shows up, and I want to know who is the guy that went, I think we're okay. <laughs> And as that began to evolve, now you start to see how it interacts with our characters. And while this doesn't look like it's profound, this is a, this is a lot of just time and money and smart people putting it all together. And ultimately in the movie, 
and it ended up looking pretty cool. And even though it's an austere set, it still looked delicious, which is what we asked them to do. Um, now, going back to story, because I showed you a bunch of storyboards from Cloudy One, I wanted to show you a shot progression. So, uh, as a story artist, I'm really proud of what we do. I mean, uh, our job isn't just about the drawings, it's really about movement, it's about storytelling, it's about pacing, it's about you know capturing something. So uh, early on we knew we had to sort of build this introduction to the food and it was one of those things that marketing grabbed a hold of so we had to get this shot through you know, through all of our production channels really quick. So what I want to show you is uh, this, this, this piece is sort of, uh, mostly it's Brandon Jeffords, who's my head of story. Uh, some of my drawings are in there, some Cody's drawings are in there, but you're gonna see just a very loose representation of an introduction to the food in Sardine Circle. And then I'm gonna show you how it progressed through layout and animation. <laughs> carry him until he passes the BSUSB. And by pass, you mean... Yes. Look, we better get a move on before we run into any more of these creatures. that kind of blueprint down we very quickly shoved it into production so we built the set which is based on the um, the kind of central kind of uh, business district of Swallow Falls and uh, James Williams our head of layout started working very closely with our animation team and we began to sort of I think with I would say probably 20 30 people build this shot in like two weeks so um, what I'm going to show you right now is rough animation through layout <laughs> And then from there, by the time we put our, our, our final touches on the animation, we get into our lighting, it starts to look and feel like this. Ah, here, you take it, you take it. <laughs> You're going to have to carry him until he passes the BSUSB. And by pass, you mean? Yes. Look, we better get a move on before we run into any more of these creatures. <laughs> production value, all of that kind of rich stuff starts with scribbles and, you know, a conversation in the story room. And, and uh, you know, I can't speak highly enough of the team of people that helped us get there. And, you know, it's just a, it's a beautiful thing when you finally see a movie come together. So um, having the opportunity to kind of kind of be in the chair I was in in this film was really exciting. Um, now, I think I'm probably over my time. Do you guys want to see a delete the scene? Yeah. <laughs> Um, the sound in here is a little fucked because we got it from editorial, but uh, you'll notice when lips aren't moving and sounds coming out, that's a mistake. <laughs> but uh, essentially, uh, if anybody's seen the movie, the idea is uh, Barb comes to take Flint out of uh, Tim's house so that he can go up to Chester V and get sent on this mission. And Flint thinks he might be getting fired, so he's kind of freaked out. Um, and this scene was actually boarded very early on, stuck in the movie very early on, and originally Barb didn't speak. She was going to reveal that she had a, you know, the ability to talk later on in the film. So as you'll notice, that Barb doesn't talk in this scene, and we're really playing. We were looking at The Shining, and we we're looking at a lot of horror movies, and sort of Tim's impression of losing his son to this ape. So uh, to me, that's funny, and and we we did it. So here it is. Just if he wants to see me. Oh no. Am I being fired because of the incident today? <laughs> Okay, no, 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 wait, 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 I, 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 I just need to grab my stuff, hold on. Jack, maybe Chester will give me another chance. Son, uh, Steve. I don't think you should run off into the night with that, uh, monkey person lady thing. Oh, there you go, Steve, come on. Steve. Hey, ask that Mr. V there, we the can go mistake. home again.
dollars a minute. That's a big mistake. <laughs> so, any questions? <laughs> yeah, shoot. Um, did you know going into this film that you were going to be producing it in stereo? And if so, yes. you did. So how? Many Oh, okay. Uh, so, gentleman here asked if we were uh, aware that we were going to make the movie in stereo. And how much did that affect uh, your storytelling? And how much did that affect our storytelling? Um, so, on Cloudy One, um, about halfway through that production, we had the choice come down that we were going to make it in stereo. And um, so all of, our, all of our story team had this course on what works and what doesn't work in stereo. And we began to respond immediately on the story side to compositionally how we were going to handle our CG. And one of our, our CG leads, a guy named Vaughn Williams, is very passionate that, that 3D needs to be comfortable for the audience. The gimmick is never going to survive if people don't enjoy the experience. And so one of the things that you know, has been learned for, for, for years of kind of working with stereo is that stuff coming out of the camera all of a sudden hurts people's heads. And I don't know the science behind it, but it's, it's, it's got to do with sort of how you're asking the eye to adjust in terms of, of, of how it's perceiving depth. So we approached our, our process, our creative choices were based upon the idea that the screen was a shoebox and the action played into the screen. And so um, any time that we had a character that was very close to being like a three quarter over the shoulder where like the head was cut off or you know there was, there was like a, a, a bit of a, a, a kind of a dirty, dirty uh, coverage on, on one side of the frame, we would, we would push it in so that the character is completely there. So you had that Mystery Science Theater 3000 feeling where it's like these people are silhouetted and they're in this world. Now every now and then stuff will come out at you. We do have those moments where like the characters flourish or you know some gag happens where something will come out of the audience, but we're very careful that we prepare the audience's perception so that when that happens we're not shocking them. And, and, and it's all subliminal because you, you want to watch the movie and forget that you're watching a 3D movie. So I don't know if you had a chance to see this in 3D. Um, I don't tend to like 3D, especially because I have like one bum eye that doesn't work so well. But when we were, when we were, when we were going through the process, um, our 3D department really chased our layout department. So if you're familiar with the CG pipeline, we come on a story, we come through editorial, and then we go into layout where we start putting like real cameras in our, our facsimile set. And at that point, when we start to block out our shots, Vaughn would start to communicate with James Williams, who was our head of layout, and we started to make CG, or 3D choices, stereo choices there. Um, so that way, when it goes into animation, um, everybody is, is thinking about it. Not that that's their priority, because in, in animation, you're thinking about your shot, your character, your, but certainly it was part of the conversation in that room, you know, are we, are we, hurting ourselves CG. So we're trying to make the movie at that point for two audiences. One's a 2D audience that needs to consume it at that level, and, and, and we want that to be a good experience. We also want the 3D experience, or the stereo experience, to be just as equally enjoyable. So um, on both movies, we got a lot of compliments from people to say, you know, said that they enjoyed the experience watching the CG, so hopefully people liked it. But I do think, you know, having intent is really important because when you do it post, it doesn't. We did we did the open season post, and it didn't it didn't feel compelling. It felt like a gimmick, you know, what I mean? as opposed to being a compositional enriching tool. So, but it was really interesting to see what worked and what didn't work. For example, on the first film, like the Burger Rain scene, um, we I ended up pulling the camera back quite a bit on shots, and we were really trying to get the feeling like the burgers were. Not that the burgers were coming past you, that the burgers sort of started at the frame and then came in. So that way we weren't kind of pushing the burgers towards you, they were falling away. Does that make sense? And so that way it was like a comfortable comfortable way to consume it. And even when they were coming at you, we were very careful to not have them come right at the eyes because that's really hard for, because you're watching the whole thing and then suddenly you're, you're asking the eyes to kind of pull in. And so we were very careful to not do that. There was a hot dog egg that was really cheeky where it kind of went right out of the camera. Uh, <laughs> Which I think you caught you on. I think that was like the second shot that went in because like we all kind of came out of that 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 education experience. Like, yeah, we're gonna be smart. We're not gonna do we're not gonna do the ping pong thing. We're gonna. And the first fucking shot was a hot dog coming straight at the camera. And the, the 3D guys were like, "Fuck you guys." <laughs> but no, I, I, there's a lot of respect I think for what they do. And and uh, ImageWorks has been one of the pioneers of of, uh, of of stereo going back a long way. And I, I know it's you know kind of at a lot of studios. And uh, but with the Zemeckis films you know, be they what they may, they really kind of drove a lot of innovation in that. And so there's a lot of smart people that learned from those experiences that we were able to build upon. Yeah, shoot. Uh, oh. hey, yeah, just, I wanted to ask about Barb's character design. Yeah. Um, how her body uh, is kind of like the invert of the, the 
job. It's character, I can't remember his name. Oh, Chester, yeah. Yeah, but, but I also wanted to ask, too, like, just kind of wondering, like, did Steve Jobs died about two years before the movie came out? Did anything you enter your mind, you're like, oh. Uh, should we do that? <laughs> Like yeah. That, yeah. yeah, I mean, certainly, like, you know, Steve Jobs was, like, one of the touchstones. There was a lot of other things kind of going into that. Uh, when he passed away, um, yeah, we were pretty deep in. So it was one of the things that we could talk about. It was like, is this good for us or is this in bad taste? And we just, like, ah, who cares? Let's just finish the film. <laughs> um, but, no, certainly, um, certainly, like, uh, the idea of, um, of parodying, you know, this guy who was part of history was, was, was you know, sort of part of our conversation. But... Um, you know, it wasn't like we were directly doing the Steve Jobs thing, or you know, people perceive it that way. It wasn't our intent. Um, and as far as Barb's design goes, there was two main shapes in the LiveCore um, vernacular. So it was a light bulb, which is who Chester represented, the hexagon, which is you know a great kind of scientific shape, you know, the beehive, that kind of thing. So so she was a hexagon, he was a light bulb. So those two characters. And if you watch the movie, um, the hexagon and the light bulb repeat throughout the entire uh, LiveCore design sense. Do you want me to repeat the question? I'm sorry. Oh, yes, yes, please repeat. I'm dumb. And <laughs> so I, I think this is more for the for plot of one. Uh -huh. how, how far along uh, is the story really developed before it gets approved by the studio? And it, it, was the whole thing sort of finished? Did you have to present them a whole story, or was it sort of was the pitch very or condensed and summarized? Or what was the uh, so a uh, gentleman was asking, you know, sort of uh, what phase is the story when we approach the studio to say, can we make this movie, right? Um, uh, it's it's very loose. Um, you know, the the first pitch, which I wasn't in that room. This was before I came onto the film. So the first pitch was really a concept thing. It's you know, what if we did a disaster movie for kids, and what if you know we we had this sort of big story where we took this book that had this event, and we invent these characters based on the archetypes of of these you know kind of. Um, it's like Armageddon meets blah blah blah. You know what I mean? It, it's that kind of conversation. And and um, as we would go through our process, things would get more refined, and we would have pillar points where we would have big screenings. So uh, what the studio is seeing is basically your story reel cut together with um, with with you know sound effects, uh, music, uh, everything's all temp, scratch dialogue, and we would do that every three or four months. And uh, and those are are fairly complete now. There was a few times where we would do like act one screenings or act one into act two screenings and we'd have beat boards for the end. Um, on a cloudy one, we had a couple of resets. You know, it kind of said we started over. Every time we started over, it's usually in response to a screening. So like you would put the movie up and, and the studio would look at it and then you would get the big notes. It's like conceptually, you know, are we rooting for Flint? Do we do we think that, you know, Flint stalking Sam since she was eight years old is, is appealing? You know, <laughs> these sorts of questions become apparent. and. It's hard because when you come to a screening, you're really kind of pulling your pants down in front of a lot of people that are very um, scared and judgmental because they're sitting on $100 million, and you know, it's a big deal. Um, but what you're trying to do is get those no's. You want those no's because you don't want to put something out that people don't like, and you're really trying to stand back from the trees. And you know anybody who's a parent here, you know you're raising your kid, and you think you're just surviving day to day. Like you don't really know what the fuck you're doing. You're just trying to get through the day. And it's the same thing making a movie. You know you're just trying to make the best decision you can make with the information you have. And until you put it up in front of an audience, you really don't know. And our first audience is a studio because they're the ones that need to you know buy off on this thing. So on Cloudy One, it was for me it was about four and a half years, and it was closer to the fourth year when we got our official green light. Um, was there any uh, times where you were totally, totally butted heads with them in terms of where you thought the story should go? And where mm -hmm. you thought? Yeah, I mean, that, that, that always happens. I mean, by the nature of sort of having an opinion, you think you're the smartest person in the room, and then you have to be proven wrong, and that's, that's always tough, you know? Um, uh, uh, I do think that Chris and Phil set a great tone of conversation. So when they would get back in the corners and didn't like something that was being sort of presented to them, they were very good at sort of politically not committing and finding a way to wiggle out of the situation and find a better solution. So say we were pitching story B, and the studio came back and said, we don't like B, we want you to do C. They would wiggle around and try to buy time so they could come up with story versions, you know, H, J, Q, P, D, F, you know, and they would find the one that they liked the best and then come back to the studio and said, you didn't like this, 
we're bumping on this, so here's a, here's a solution that maybe both of us can be happy. And, and I think that was smart because at the end of the day, you have to be flexible. You have to be able to, you know, trust the process that you're, you, you, you can find a better solution. And, and, and you know what? There's stuff that I love that we had to kill, and the movie got better for it. And you didn't realize it was going to happen when you were doing it. Do you know what I mean? You just kind of have to, you kind of have to just trust that it's, it's for the best and that you'll find the best answer sometime, you know, because you have smart people all around you. So. Um, yeah. Can you compare uh, your experience as a director to your experience in story and how story informed your position as a director? Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of your, uh, so uh, you, uh, Tom was asking, you know, can you compare your experience as a director and how the experience as a story artist informs that job? So uh, to your second question, as a story artist, um, we get to be part of a very small team at the beginning of a movie. And the, the interesting thing about that is you get to watch it happen. You get to watch the mistakes. You get to watch the good times. You get to watch the bad times. You get to watch the crisis. You get to watch the political upheavals. And you get to see how smart people get through that. So I got a real education watching movies get made from that perspective. And I think there's a savviness that you, let's face it, as artists, we didn't get to being successful by socializing. You know, we got there by sitting in our rooms and drawing while other people went out and played hockey. You know that, and, and and so part of our job is to be social and to be political and to be in the in the playground and actually sort of have everybody feel like they're heard. And 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 there's it's a real education that I I got over a handful of movies in terms of how to not get mad at something that's happening in the room and how to relax and how to let it sort of roll over you and how to respond. So that was really good. Um, the other thing I think in story, you're always changing. You're always, you're always uh, it's like spaghetti on the wall. You're not afraid of failure. You're not afraid to, to sort of, uh, you know, have somebody not like your idea because there's always 10 more ideas that I could come up with. And so part of the fun of what we do is like improv. It's a yes and group, you know? Um, so you're, you're, uh, you're the, the, the ability to kind of handle the, the Durham and Strang and still make the movie is something that's really important if you're directing a film. What was your first question? Did you compare your experience as a director? Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, okay, so like, um, uh, my experience, okay, so you ever toboggan? <laughs> okay, so you get onto the movie, and it's like the first the first time you get on the movie, you're going down the hill, it's like, this is fucking awesome, I love this, I want to do this all the time, and you have to walk up the hill. That's the story part, getting up that hill. Um, once you get out of story, um, I was so, um, so for me as a story artist, I love the challenge of walking up that hill. So it's not like it's a big pain in the ass that I feel. You know, it's not like I'm, you know, in a coal mine or anything. Like it's it's pretty easy work. Um, but emotionally, there's a lot of investment. You're spending a lot of time, and you're always sort of full of this Durham strain. But that Durham strain is what we love to do, and that Jenga, that Tetris, that trying to fit everything together is is the excitement of the job. And it's also the hardest part of the job. So once we got story done. I think I can speak for both me and Cody. There's a certain point where you just start to enjoy watching smart people do their jobs. So we would go into the animation reviews, and um, we had 85 animators in Vancouver, give or take a few, and about 20 in LA. So it was a big crew. And we'd come in, and they would show us stuff that would make us laugh. And we would see, we've seen this movie a billion times, and we were sick of all the jokes. And they would refresh it, and they would sort of make it fresh again. And they would inspire the conversation. And the yes and would grow out of their work, and I love that. And uh, you know, we got to go to Abbey Road to do the music, and I'm sitting in a room with Mark Mothersbaugh watching 89 people play amazing instruments. And at that point, I'm just thumbs up. It's just like I, I don't know what's good or bad. I just like it, you know. And it, and 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 there's just like an amazing sort of, and that's going down the hill. So to go back to the toboggan thing, you go down the hill once, it's like this is great, and you have to go up the hill and it sucks, and then you go down the hill again and it's awesome because you you know what you're experiencing. You know what I mean? So so I, I feel like the uh, the the directing thing, I got to go down the hill twice. So, you know, most times on the story crew, I just go down the hill once and have to walk up and then I get kicked off the movie. So, so, so it, was, it was really awesome to be able to sort of watch the child grow and develop and turn into something that, you know, you can show to an audience and sort of get their response, which is cool. question I mean I think um, oh so what's the biggest obstacle in terms of, of 
breaking the film. Um, I, I gotta go back to story. I think you know coming up with a good, believable story to kind of take these characters to a new journey is is, is the hardest thing. You know, it's it, it, and it was the hardest thing in the first film. It was it took us the longest to get through that department. It's it's um, it's the thing you struggle with. And um, you know, if I could give myself advice to do it again, I'm probably still too close to it to really have any you know clean objective. Um, I think I think uh, screening more early on and and trying to get as much audience response early so that you can start to sort of feel out sort of where because you know you spend a lot of time trying to make the movie on the political side and there's making the movie on the audience side and the two things don't always happen at the same time they have the same desire to make a good film you know but you know you you have the politics where you're just trying to get the movie made and then there's the you know is it good and does it, you know, does it suck? Will people like it? Will people have a good time in the theater? So those two things are hard sometimes to juggle early on and I think there's a way to do that. Um, that uh, I think we got more comfortable with, because you know, there's an instinct to sort of protect it and sort of get it polished. Um, that storyboard sequence I showed you, the progression roll, that was fairly deep on the movie and like those are really scribbly drawings and there's something I love about them now. Do you know what I mean? And I think early on I was less comfortable with that looseness, even though I'm a story artist. Do you know what I mean? Like you want to put your best foot forward. So towards the end we relaxed and I wish I could start relaxed because I don't think it would have been, I think we would have gotten further. Do you know what I mean? Because you get more and you're loose. All right. Big man. The future of the feature uh, industry, feature animation industry, is bright uh, because they're still making lots of money and they're still making quite a few films. Uh, the problem is, is that these things are getting more and more expensive. And uh, because they're getting more expensive, the, the, the range of what we make gets narrower and narrower and narrower. And we'll, I think eventually we'll get to the place where we're going to kind of kill our own audience because we're not going to be showing them anything kind of new and different. Uh, we're not going to be showing them any new themes because it's, we're doing the same kind of safe type stuff. I mean, there, there's a reason that now, you know, almost every film has the, the kind of theme of, you can do it, just believe. <laughs> you, know, you don't have to work at it, just believe. There's a reason that's like that, because that's a very safe theme. Uh, it doesn't upset anybody, and it's, it's aspirational. People can reach for that. You know, if I'm down and out and I can't make it, I just believe and it'll happen. It's total bullshit, of course, but that is what we're selling to everybody. Um, more difficult themes um, would make our industry better. But the only way we can do that is by splitting our, uh, our medium into genres. Notice that I don't say animation is a genre, though that's how it's defined in, uh, in most Hollywood circles. We're a medium. A genre is we can do whatever genre we want. We can do something, a preschool for you know, five-year-old girls who you know, love ponies, unicorns, and you know, sweet things. Or we can do porn, which people do. Those are all genres, and they can all be done in animation. So in animation, the only way we can hit genres is to have it make sense financially. And the only way to have it make sense financially is to do it in such a way where the budgets match the genre. So you'll see a lot of uh, animated films come out of Japan, or Asia in general, that have a lot of great themes. Um, some are executed well and some aren't, but there's a wide breadth of what they can do. And that's because they have a technique in which they can make these films way, way cheaper. And they have an audience who, who's willing to accept those themes. Um, the techniques that we use here are extraordinarily expensive. So the only way to get those themes here is to bring that, those prices down. So if you're going to do a romantic comedy, romantic comedies typically only cost about $30 million. 
So when's the last time you saw a feature animated film in North America made for $30 million? There are very few, and if they're done, the quality is quite low. Uh, are you willing to accept that quality? Um, you can do some stuff in 2D. I mean, uh, uh, Sylvain Chaumet has, been, has did tri Triplets of Belleville or The Illusionist, and they're the sub, sub uh, um, $20 million range. And he does, uh, in his genres, uh, his themes are good. I mean, they're more adult. Uh, but it can be argued that he's not making his money back, meaning that he's not, uh, he's not sustainable. And maybe in the end he's sustainable, but it's not the sort of uh, returns that investors want. Um, people like uh, Cartoon Saloon, who are doing The Secret of Kells and uh, Song of the Sea, and their next one is The Breadwinner, those are all sub-$10 million films. Uh, and while they're designed very well, uh, the budgets show. And though those who are into animation can really enjoy that for a wider audience, it's difficult to, to make your money back. So. Basically the challenge is, for everyone, everyone in this room, everyone in animation in general, if we want to see this industry grow and be healthy, uh, be broader, do more mature things, uh, when I say mature I don't mean adult, I just mean uh, more themes, just do more genres, we have to create a way that allows us uh, to create these things at a reasonable cost so that it gives everyone an opportunity to make the things that they want to make. Maybe I'm part of the, the old guard where I kind of only see it in one way because that's the way that I was, grow I was brought up in the industry. This is the way that I've seen it work and this is kind of the way that I know. So it's difficult for me to see how things are happening on Netflix and Hulu and on the net or mobile or whatever and trying to make that work, for me it's really, really hard. Maybe for you, it's much, much easier. Maybe there's a path that's much clearer to you. If you see something, let me know, because I would love to take advantage of it. I'll even pay you for it. <laughs> um, but for me, I think that is the, what I'm really looking forward to for the future of this industry, just to be able to fragment the, fragment the industry so that we can get more good quality content on more platforms out there.